Hi there, my name is Clint Mason, president of Kaizen Well Solutions. And today we're gonna to talk about horizontal wells and liquid movement in those wells. And some of the things that we've done to enhance well production using both gas lift and plunger lift. One of the very earliest things you're gonna see, so we're gonna talk, first of all, this is a vertical well, showing a, a representation of a decline curve. And when you're Flowing along, you've got a projected decline. And then as we start reaching critical rate, my experience has been it's about 20% higher than the calculated critical rates. You're gonna start seeing a, a, a deviation in that decline. Typically that's gonna be due to liquid loading. Now, when we put in a plunger lift or we do some sort of optimization uh, intervention, when we're moving down this line, this this decline rate that's been uh, affected by liquid loading, if we put a plunger lift at this point. Basically what we see, and this is almost in every case, we just return back to the original decline rate. Now, what that means is that uh, you get this big pop in production and everybody's real happy and that's a, that's a great solution. Your people are controlling the money or happy because I see an increase in production. But one of the problems with waiting until you get these large increases in production is, you see we return back to our normal decline, but one of the problems with that is, what happens to this production? This production between where we started to liquid load, deferred production, and when we do, we do something. Well, typically what we find is that that production results and returns or is recovered at the end of the life of the well. Now it's typically very difficult to recover this. It requires a lot more energy, compression, pump, you know, you, you've got to start putting energy into the well. So it's much more expensive to recover. So in a vertical well, if you really want to be active or, or sorry, successful, what you should be doing is calculating when you're going to start seeing these critical rates and start adding your optimization method early in the well's life you don't want a large increase in production because a large increase in production means all you've done is pushed a huge amount of your production down here where it's very expensive to recover. So early intervention, although you don't see big increases, actually has a much bigger value to your co company. Now horizontal wells work pretty significantly different. One of the things you've got uh, multiple areas that are producing. You've got your horizontal section and when we see a well come on typically what happens is during the initial cleanup you're pushing all that fluid out and you're staying above critical rate and then we'll start to see liquid loading in the transitional area or churn flow area right in the transitional area of the of the well then we'll start seeing liquid loading from the toe to the heel and it kind of sits there and it slugs along and a big majority of these wells lives are, are down in this area here. Um, a lot of wells that we look at are actually liquid loading very shortly after they're brought online. Um, but what we're always trained to look for is liquid loading in the tubing. Now, the problem with that is this well has been liquid loading all through the toe, through the heel, transitional air for, for a long period of time. Uh, and long before you get to liquid loading in the uh, in the tubing. So that, what happens there is we come along and we say, oh, we're at critical rate now in our tubing, forgetting that we've been liquid loaded behind the tubing, and we start doing something. We'll put a plunger lift in, we do some sort of deliquification method. Typically what happens is when we put a, per, a plunger lift in, what'll happen is we don't go straight up like we would see in a vertical well. We don't go back to this line. What we actually see is this line goes across. So it changes angle. So instead of being very sharp, it'll actually change. It will come across and we'll intersect this line and then continue on down your, uh, your, your you know, to the life of, of the well. Now, the, one of the, the, the real problems is, is, well, what does that mean for well optimization? Well, what it really means is that long before we get to tubing critical rate, we need to be looking at a well's overall production and identifying and realizing that it is liquid loading 
uh, back in these areas. So again, if we were to intervene earlier, now that may not be a plunger lift, but it could be things like gas lift. It could be even something as simple as shutting a well in once or twice a day for an hour or so to build up some energy to allow that um, liquid that's building up in those horizontal areas and, and around that transitional area to be slugged out or forced out uh, with a, with a sh uh, high rate, short period of high rate um, uh, flow. So as we're going through this, this is something to remember. Long before we're actually identifying liquid loading, these wells are liquid loading. And the other thing is, and something we've noticed is if we intervene, the farther back here, you know, back up this side that we intervene, what you actually, you do the same thing, like you, you bring the production starts to go across, it's, it flattens out, you change that decline and it, and it works its way over to this, this period here. So the longer we wait, so if we're waiting down here when tubing is liquid loading, one of the big problems is that you, you've got a, a huge amount of built up fluid and you've lose, lost a lot of energy to move that fluid and it's very hard to get it going again. So we want to react way back up here when we're starting to see liquid loading in these other parts of the well and forcing that liquid out and optimizing earlier. So the difference between we're waiting till we're, we're liquid loaded in the tubing to re reacting to some liquid loading behind there is we do end up with this lost production as well, which is never really recovered. So again, deferred production that is never recovered. So talking about a well, you've got your horizontal area, your transitional area, and your vertical area. Here's our tubing represent, re representing in this, uh, this diagram. And what you're kind of seeing is, is an interesting flow pattern, is we're getting liquid and gas is coming into these horizontal area here. And you're basically got a gigantic separator. So here's, here's an example. So if you have 7,000 feet of four and a half inch ID horizontal has a capacity of about 108 barrels. So if you have a well that's producing 40 or even 50 barrels a day, it has two days of storage capacity in this horizontal area. So if you're producing gas, condensates or oils and water, basically it has a lot of time to start to separate. Now, as that liquid moves and carries on to the, uh, to the transitional area here, you get a, a, a separation. So the gas moves very fast on the top. It sweeps a lot of the liquids of the lighter ends, oils and stuff along and carries it up into the tubing. But your other fluids, your waters and, and different things like that, they start getting into what's this churn flow. Basically, it's being forced to the lower side. There's nothing there to push it because the gases break around on top slides back down here and just kind of repeats. So you have constant slugging. And this is the area where you're going to see probably your first significant liquid loading or uh, slugging in, in the well bore. Another interesting thing is you look at pipelines and when they were looking at uh, moving liquid through uh, undulating pipelines up and down, there's a lot of information that says you need a, or you require about 15 to 20 feet per second to move that fluid efficiently through a pipeline. So even though when we look at critical rates, it says it's, it's much lower than that. If we look at 15 to 20 feet per second in this horizontal section here, um, it's a significant um, rate. I mean, four and a half, five million standard cubic feet a day just to move fluid efficiently through there. Doesn't mean that it's not moving fluid, but it's sweeping the stuff on the surface. You're getting separation, which is building up into uh, the lower areas and, and, and the peak area in the valleys of, the, of your horizontal section. Your critical flow distribution in the tubing and casing, just a representation of what it actually does to your critical rate. And you can see your flow rates as, as we come around the corner here how they will increase. Here's an example. This is in uh, E3, for example, but if we're at one and as we get to C, which is about 45 degrees, you're gonna be closer to four times that. So, so your critical rate of one for a number here is actually four here. And then the tubing, um, or actually, sorry, you can actually see it's all, all, almost up to six. So there's a significant increase to move that fluid in that four and a half through this 
four and a half area. And even in your tubing, it is about four times higher than what they're saying to move fluid through here. Now, I don't necessarily believe that this is a proper representation because I know it takes a lot more uh, velocity than that or rate than that to move liquid in just a pipeline. So if anybody could tell me what the difference is between a horizontal well bore section and a pipeline and the way the fluid will react, I'd be interested in, in finding out what that is. But I do know that liquid does not move at uh, at these very low rates. They basically sit there, builds up, and creates all sorts of other issues. So what we end up with is liquid breaking down. And when we drill a well, it's not a nice straight tube, whether it's toe up or toe down. You've got this constant undulation as, as, the, as the drill bits going through there. So you get a, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of low spots that are dropping fluid and building fluid and creating small restrictions all the way along. So that also increases the pressure on, on, your, on your horizontal section. Another interesting thing that uh, <clears throat> we have found is that liquid in a horizontal well is the li liquid calm or liquid level is typically above the end of tubing. So here's an example. This would be where your end of tubing would be. And we did this over you know, a, a large number of wells where we did continuous fluid level monitoring using a, 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 uh, like an echo meter type device. And this is very stand, this is very similar between all the wells where you would see this liquid and it's sitting, you know, three, four, five hundred feet or a couple hundred meters above the end of tubing. Now you'd kind of wonder how that's possible. How can you have fluid constantly sitting above the end of tubing? Because you know, if the tubing is under fluid, why is it still flowing? But here's what's really happening is we're getting this slug that's carrying along, it's got a you're getting a slug because you've got a high pressure area behind it and a low pressure area in front of it, basically, because it's flowing up the tubing. As that liquid slams into the end of the tubing, only a percentage of the liquid moves into the tubing. Well, a bunch of it is pushed past the end of the tubing. And then with that high pressure area behind it, it holds that liquid above the end of tubing. Now, as the next slug is moving towards the end of tubing, you get a low pressure or the pressure starts to drop. Um, and that liquid that's been pushed or hung up above the end, the end of the tubing here starts to collapse and enter the tubing. And so you have this very dynamic uh, undulation of fluid where it's slamming into the end of the tubing. Some of it is carrying up. When the, uh, that fluid that's entered the tubing kind of moves out of the way, of course, the energy that pushed all that fluid there is going to go up the tubing as well. And the pressures are going to drop. And then the the fluid that didn't enter the tubing will start to drop and it just keeps repeating the cycle. So you have this very, very active um, area right in here. And you also have all the churn flow and all sorts of other things that are going on that can create uh, a lot of liquid fallback. Very interesting thing that we learned early on is that end of tubing makes a huge difference in the way these wells produce. Um, Typically, we recommend that end of tubing should be at about 70 degrees. What we did find, though, is that if you have tubing that's sitting down in, in your heel, we can go in and perforate this tubing anywhere from about 55 to 70 degrees and get some significant improvement in the way the well produces. Now, um, you know, originally when we were doing it, we were putting plugs in the end of the tubing and forcing the liquid and the gas to flow around the outside and back through these perforations. And, we talk about a perforation, we're doing an, a, like an eight-foot strip gun with a multi, you know, 36, 40 shots over that eight feet um, to create a, a really good path. But um, now we don't bother putting plugs or any kind, anything on the end of this tubing. We, we know that the liquid and the gas is going to take the path of least resistance. We're going to allow gas to enter into this tubing. And really what this does, when this end of tubing is sitting down here, we're getting slugs. Every time you shut the well in for sure, what you'll see is all that liquid that's sitting around the outside of the tubing and, and around here collapses, typically builds up around the end of the tubing. When you bring a well back on, it has to push all of that liquid up into the tubing to get out of the way before you get gas entry. So you'll see a lot of wells that uh, after being shut in for 15 or 20 minutes, you have a very hard time starting them up again, um, which is a problem with plunger lift. 
or you'll have them where they're flowing along and they kind of upset you get a compressor upset and you end up having to swab the wells to bring them back on where if you do this we find very few wells uh, have that same issue because instead of pushing that solid liquid column into the tubing and then trying to push it to surface we're actually allowing some gas to enter you're getting gas and liquid is entering in this in these areas and so it's gasifying the column and and uh, slowing the entry of that liquid um, to allow it to push it to surface so that's actually a very probably one of the the biggest things that we figured out is end of tubing and how critical it is to the overall wells performance uh, this is kind of a uh, another interesting thing when you're trying to run a plunger lift and I've said you've got to start reacting much sooner than uh, the tubing uh, critical rate or liquid loading and a tubing critical rate so how do you make that effective with a plunger lift so um, if you use kind of the old rule of thumbs what you would do is you would you know here's a plunger well it's shut in you bring it on you get a high spice flow rate as the plunger is lifting the fluid, it drops off, and then fluid hits surface, and it slowly unloads, and then plungers at surface, and then you get a period of time where you'll typically get a, a fairly liquid-free shot of gas. And then we would normally, the vertical, we would shut that in and repeat the cycle. But in a horizontal well, what we've done is we've basically conditioned the tubing. We've run that plunger through the, the through the tubing, removed as much of the fluid as we possibly can. We've got a high energy area still underneath. We've, we've got a, the end of tubing as low as we can possibly do because it's nice and clean. And we have a good differential. And we're using that to actually drive fluid through the horizontal, through the transitional, back into the tubing. And we find that the majority of the fluid is actually produced in your slug after the plunger comes to surface. And that could happen once or twice or even three times if the well is really strong. So when you're working on a well that might be several times above your critical rate, really all you're doing with the plunger is cleaning that tubing, making sure that you're getting as low a pressure as possible at end of tubing. So where your energy source is back at the perforations or formation, it's able to push that fluid, get it into the tubing and lift it. So it's almost a, uh, like a controlled slug that you're using. So this tech, this idea allows these wells uh, to move the water and other things that are separating in that horizontal section. It keeps it moving, so you don't you don't get a buildup of a much heavier fluid like like water near the end of tubing that all of a sudden you know enters in one big slug and and upsets the the way the well's flowing and they're you know they're they're dying at two million a day when they should be well above critical. So there's there's a there's a real advantage with doing that. So one of the key things is understanding that you need to wait for that second slug. Now, as your wells get weaker and closer and closer to actual tubing critical rate, the you know in this example, the plunger is probably only doing five or ten percent of the actual work. It's moving a small amount of fluid out of the tubing, and then the well is unloading a whole bunch of fluid on its own. So it's doing most of the work. But as the well gets closer to critical rate in the tubing what you'll find is the amount of work the plunger needs to do increases. So you need to do more and more cycles. So in a real well, well that might be flowing significantly above critical rate, um, you may re still run a conventional plunger, shut it in once a day uh, to cycle that plunger and let the well do all the work for the rest of the day. But as it gets closer to critical rate, then you might look at a free cycle or a two piece where you start lifting more and more of the fluid with the plunger, making more and more cycles. And then as you come, as the well gets even more uh, or it becomes weaker, you have to start shutting in the well more and more. And you might switch then from a free cycle or a two piece back to a conventional. And, and you go, can go through these, these changes through the life of the well. So lots of times you'll see Conventional plunger cycling once or twice a day just to allow it to really kick that fluid up when you're well above critical rate. And then you'll move to a two piece free cycle when you're really needing to move lots of fluid with the plunger and it needs to do more of the work. And then you'll slowly, as that it well loses the, the drive and the energy, uh, you'll see it switch back to a, a solid type plunger again. So there's, a, there's multiple stages through the life of these lift well. Some interesting information when we perf tubing, 
the before flow, after flow. You know, this is a well that's constantly slugging, really having a hard time. If it, they lost the well at all, they wouldn't get it back to after they perfed it. Another example back in here. So it's just interesting stuff. Here's some examples, and we see this pretty well on every horizontal well we work on. We don't see, so this is your decline rate, or this is the gas production rate. And after we put a plunger lift in it, it changes the way it's declining. And we see that over and over and over. And it's important to know that early intervention will make that change to that, that decline rate um, uh, and, and impacts the well's production. So here's just some examples going from conventional plungers to free cycles, different things we've, we've done, how using the right plunger with the right off time can really make a big difference. One of the big things is uh, total production time in a horizontal well, which is quite different than a vertical well, is, does not necessarily mean better production. So we see a lot of horizontal wells where we'll switch them from hours a day of production time to say 12 hours on 12 hours off using a free cycle plunger for example where we have 15 or 20 minutes of off time and 15 or 20 minutes of flow time and the overall production will come up 20 or 30 percent over uh, say a conventional plunger that's only cycling uh, two or three times a day with an hour off and then even though the total time is per day is only 12 hours, we're getting a much better results. We'll also see where uh, two-piece plungers uh, will replace them with uh, free cycle or replace them even with a conventional and we'll get the same. So there's no there's no guarantee that you can, you know, one plunger is better than the other. You need to match your production to the way the well builds up, how much energy it has, how much fluid it's trying to move, even even the, um, you know, the, the, the way the well has been drilled can impact uh, how that liquid's going to move. So you got to work through several different uh, trials on each well to figure out what's going to give you the best bang for your buck. So some of the things we've learned is the transitional area loads up long before the tubing. And, and we're constantly installing plunger lifts now in wells that are doing two or three million a day or 70, 80, 90 E3 of, of gas, uh, you know, 200, 400 barrels a day is not unusual for when we're starting to intervene with these wells. And uh, so, you, so you need to look long before tubing liquid loading occurs uh, to, to make sure they're op optimized. The horizontal section constantly is slugging. There's lots of fluid separation between water, oil, and condensate. Uh, we can prove, you know, if, if you go to any one of your wells that produces any kind of water and it is, uh, you go to start it up or you need to um, swab it to bring it on, I almost guarantee you those first few swabs are going to be nearly 100% water, even if you're low rates to, you know, 10% or 8% of water cut, you're going to see mostly water that comes back. And then, uh, then you'll go back to kind of your normal cut afterwards. And that's a buildup and a separation that's happening in that transition area throughout that well bore. So you can get some very um, dynamic uh, actions, you know, fluid separation, constant slugging. I kind of equate it to you're trying to produce a well through a separator that uh, every once in a while overflows and kicks fluid at you. So you, you, it, it, and it, it's erratic. So it takes a lot of thinking to uh, figure out what's going to give you the best results. End of tubing is critical. If you got the end of tubing either too high or too low, you're going to be struggling continuously. Top profile, we I've always believed that you should have that top profile, which is where you would land a plunger lift in that 45 to 55 degree area. You can go deeper. Um, there's not a typically not a lot of advantage though because your true vertical distance between say 70 degrees and 55 or is practically nothing and you don't get a lot of advantage and I mean it's it's it, it's actually more trouble than it's worth because it's very difficult to uh, run wire line and and other things once you get past about that 55 degrees so and getting a getting a bottom hole spring set properly so it's not uh, uh, jacking out of the the profile nipple or whatever. So that's typically what we do. We have great the best results there. 
and uh, your tubing and wellhead should match. I mean, I see people that try to run two and seven eighths uh, or two and three eighths tubing with two and seven eighths wellhead, then try to run a plunger lift on top. It can create all sorts of other issues. Uh, you can't, I mean, it limits the type of plunger you typically can use. It also can damage the, uh, the tubing crossover. You can have issues dropping tubing. I've actually seen tubing get dropped into a well that had to be fished out later. And uh, it, just, it just never works as good. So it's, it's worth doing the conversion. You'll get better production and a longer life out of that. So those are a few of the things. And the, the last thing I'll say, Gapler or Pagel. So gas assist to plunger lift. All the rules that you use for plunger lift still apply whether it's Gapler or Pagel. The difference between Gapel and Pagel is gas assisted plunger lift, you operate it like a plunger lift. The gas is there to assist the plunger lift. So the mindset is like uh, off times and all that stuff that you would normally run a plunger lift. That's that's kind of the main driver for your optimization. You typically are in a Gapel mode once you have reached the lowest point of injection, whether it's orifice or, or whatever, and you're going to run the plunger from uh, just above that point. Pagel, which is plunger assisted gas lift, really is is a slightly different mindset you're really a gas lift well that plunger is helping you so if you were well, let's say uh, three or four mandrels above the uh, uh, lowest injection point you would run uh, you might run a plunger for wax control or or it'll, it'll even just help you uh, get lower into the well because you're lifting that fluid a little more efficiently and uh, but you still need to run the rest of the well below the plunger like gas lift. So you'd be looking at continuous injection and different things. So the main driver for optimization is the gas lift and the way you would run it, it would be with that gas lift mindset and the plunger is there just to assess assisting. Regardless of either one, you still have to be aware of velocities and damages and the speed you can bring that plunger up and ensure that you're following all, all of the same safe operating practices for your plunger lift. Anyways, uh, the last thing is you really can't run a plunger below a side pocket mandrel, at least uh, with a standard equipment. And uh, uh, so, so you need a conventional uh, gas lift system in order to run a plunger. So that's, uh, like I said, everything you basically need to know that you, you'll learn a plunger lift, you can run that gapel with. Uh, one of the great things is that with gas lift and a plunger, now you're controlling the energy. You can increase that energy, reduce that energy. You can you can make a lot of things happen. But it's critical to know that number one, more injection is not always better. In fact, most times people make that mistake. If the plunger's coming up slow or not working properly, they try to jam more more gas down there. Many times, all that does is open up an injection point even higher, or or increases some of the back pressure on the well. It is not necessarily going to give you better performance. So. You know, don't just assume that you should increase injection. Many times you do better by reducing injection. Uh, you need to understand the condition of your gas lift valves. So many of these wells, people come back to us and say, hey, you know, I tried a plunger lift. It didn't work with our gas lift. And, you know, looking at our pressures at surface, we, you know, we think that it surf we're at the bottom. But, you know, almost the, that surface pressure does not tell you really what's going on down the hole. Most of these wells are multi-pointing or they have uh, a significant but you know issue up hole that could be uh, showing a lower pressure at surface which would indicate that you're lower or you're not um, but then the very last thing that's really interesting is packers and horizontal wells is actually in a positive uh, a lot of times we've just put packers and wells when we're doing a gas lift conversion and planning on doing a you know starting up a gas lift and on a well that was flowing naturally, we put the packer almost identical completion except for the gas lift mandrels in the packer. We bring the well back on and, and it'll flow another six months or a year. And we haven't really changed anything in, in that other than the packer. Now, the reason the packer works is, you know, I was talking about how that fluid sl slams past the end of the tubing and you constantly have that liquid level sitting up above <clears throat> the end of tubing. Well, when you get rid of that ability so that fluid that's coming towards the end of tubing hits the end of tubing there's a packer there it actually forces all of the liquid into the tubing before the energy that drove it there can push past it and and be dissipated so you don't you don't get this extra um, 
you know, where the liquid is slamming past the end of the tubing and then dropping back in and slamming back up and drop, you know, and it really make can make quite a big difference. Um, packers and horizontal wells, very positive, especially if you can get them landed down around that 65 degrees or near the end of tubing, makes a big improvement. Uh, so, you know, ultimately my, my, uh, my suggestion would be that we run into tubing to 70, you land a packer around 65, you set a orifice just below or your for your gas injection, just below your uh, profile nipple, which should be in that 45 to 55 degrees. And then you put your conventional gas lift mandrels uh, to surface as you would normally. Now, you're gonna have the best overall results don't put in 30 you know, or 20, 20 mandrels. We put way too many mandrels in these wells. You don't have any kind of pressure drops. There's no um, stability in that. As soon as anything changes like pressure or temperatures or pressures, pretty soon you've got all sorts of multi-pointing. They're not being effective. So really a good plunger lift, is, plunger lift gapple design is going to have probably fewer gas lift valves and it's gonna have some of these other things uh, included. Anyways, this is my... Uh, uh, short, uh, I guess it's about three and a half an hour long conversation about how liquid's moving and some, uh, some things we've learned with plunger lip. Hope you enjoyed it. If you uh, like to have any more information or uh, would like to have a further discussion, feel free to reach out to me. My email is just cmason, C-M-A-S-O-N at kaizenws.com, which is K-A-I-Z-E-N ws.com. Um, look forward to hearing from you. I hope you enjoyed this. Have a great day.